Good evening, everybody, and welcome to part two of the 14th uh, edition of History of Medicine, Public Health from New York Academy of Medicine Contributed Papers. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Paul Thurman, who is director of the library. Paul? Thank you, Bob, and good evening. I'm Dr. Paul Thierman, Director of the Academy Library and its Center for the History of Medicine and Public Health. As a historical medical library for many years now, we have partnered with and supported the work of NIAM's section on the history of medicine and public health. We provide the materials and the services that help foster their good historical work. Tonight, we're going to hear four great presentations and we'll learn a lot. I'm very much looking forward to this evening's program and I'm glad you've decided to join us. Before we start, I'd like to give you a short introduction to the Academy and the Library. The New York Academy of Medicine was founded in 1847, and we are now 176 years young. Today, Naim is happy to take on the mantle of champion for health equity. We are a leading voice for innovation in public health, tackling the barriers that prevent everyone from living a healthy life. The Academy Library dates from the very beginning of NIAM. We have since grown into one of the most significant collections in the history of medicine and public health in the country, with books including an extensive collection of rare books, journals, pamphlets, illustrations, manuscripts, and archives from around the world and across the centuries. We're quite proud that the web publication Secret NYC just named us as one of the, quote, 10 most beautiful and best libraries in New York City and Forbes magazine listed us as a destination library for your 24-hour NYC trip. We invite you to connect with us both digitally and in person. To learn more, go to the library page on the NIAM website. I especially invite you to follow us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just search for NIAM history, all one word, on those platforms. To visit us in person, join one of our drop-in tours on the first Monday of each month at noon. The next one is just a week from today. I would like to let you know two further things. You may turn on closed captioning for this event, and you can pose questions for our speakers in the Zoom chat feature, which we'll address after each presentation. I very much look forward to hearing what everyone has to say. Finally, please be on the lookout for a note announcing the video of tonight's event. I hope you join us for future NIAM offerings as we seek to understand and address the challenges that prevent everyone from living a healthy life. Thank you. And I now pass the virtual podium back to Dr. Rubin, who will introduce our first speaker. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, our first speaker is Dr. James Alarisi in the Department of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery at the SUNY Downstate. The title of his presentation is The Nasal Genital Reflex, Impudence of the Past as a Lesson for a Wise Future. James, it's all yours. Thank you, Dr. Rubin. Let me just put my full screen. Everybody see my presentation? Uh, no, I think that is okay. Um, yes, yeah, so thank you, uh, Dr. Rubin and um, the New York Academy of Medicine. This is actually my uh, second year now in a row giving a presentation, and this has kind of been my little. Uh, <laughs> I was a history major in undergrad. I'm now presently uh, in the third year of my residency in ENT at SUNY Downstate. So this has been a nice way for me to still keep. Uh, keep in touch with my humanities roots. I just want to briefly um, say thank you to um, Albina Islam and Dr. Rosenfeld who helped me with this project. So the title of the talk is The Nasal General Reflex, Improvements of the Past as a Lesson for a Wiser Future. No financial disclosures. Uh, this is just a brief outline of the talk. So we'll briefly go over what the nasal general reflex was explore some of the ancient and medieval origins of the theory, um, discuss the contemporary manifestations that uh, really got myself and my colleagues interested in the, in the theory to, to begin with, and then have some takeaway points for the present. 
So the nasal general reflex, um, this is basically a theory which purported a bi-directional pathway between the nose and the genitalia. And the basis of this was that it was, it was observed that there were really only two places in the body where these, um, there was erectile tissue. The genitalia, you know, as we know about both in men, men and, and women, male and female, excuse me, male and female, but the other was within the nose. And, um, you know, it can be found throughout the nose, but predominantly within the inferior turbinate. Um, for those who kind of are, are not within, uh, haven't looked inside of a nose before, uh, this is just right at the front of the nose when you're looking in. The septum is that midline structure and the inferior turbinate um, are these kind of projections from the, from the lateral wall of the nose that help humidify and, and trap any pathogens that you breathe in. And they go through the cycle of engorging and then kind of compressing. And it was a theory that was actually seen in some um, prominent uh, medical journals and even some textbooks within different disciplines within medicine up until the mid 20th century. So it really got us uh, before it ultimately kind of disappeared altogether. So it really got myself and my colleagues interested in, you know, what were the origins of this uh, now debunked theory and um, how did it kind of maintain and uh, present itself into the contemporary period? So the earliest uh, depictions uh, of a connection between the nose and the genitalia actually come from um, South Asia in the uh, Sushruta Samhita, which was a uh, ancient Sanskrit medical text written by uh, Sushruta, which some may know as the father of, of modern uh, plastic surgery. He had a whole subsection dedicated to catarrhal illnesses. And uh, within one of these subsections, he discussed how he observed uh, patients of his who, were, who indulged in excessive sex were uh, plagued with uh, you know, constantly runny nose and, and uh, nasal congestion. And he proposed that uh, kind of decreasing the frequency of, of the sex that you have could possibly help in the treatment of it. The next depiction of a, a connection between the nose and the genitalia really doesn't come for another 100 years, at least in our, in our literature review. And the next uh, uh, depiction in medical text is seen actually in the works of Hippocrates. Um, but Hippocrates had, a, uh, had made several observations in his medical text of significant epistaxis at the time of Menarche. And he had uh, kind of proposed that there, um, th this uh, significant epistaxis in young women may be a harbinger of having a heavy menstrual cycle later on in life. Um, 100 years from him, Aristotle and his work on physiognomy, so uh, basically the study of facial characteristics in order to better understand the character, the uh, personality and characteristics of a human, um, kind of was being published and taking form. And he had, to, you know, he'd gone over a number of different aspects of the face that he, he was able to argue that he deduced certain personality characteristics from, uh, there's a broad forehead and, you know, um, think like a lion strong. Um, but he also had a focus on the nose. And there was different characteristics of the nose, but the one that we have uh, kind of taken for particular interest because we see it come up later on in, in, uh, in ancient and Middle e uh, medieval history is the size of the nose. And he, um, he argued in his text that the size of the nose could be taken as a, a surrogate for the size of a man's phallus. So um, there took on this notion that continued on into the um, kind of late Roman and early medieval period in which uh, men with large noses had uh, large phalluses. And this painting here depicts Elagabalus, um, one of the uh, Roman, Roman emperor, emperors in the late uh, antiquity. And he was known uh, more for how much he liked the party than uh, actually governing the empire. Um, and it was, uh, it was reported that he used to venture through the, the streets of Roman cities and tried to identify future sex partners based off of the size of their nose. And this same story comes up again in the, in the medieval um, period, uh, depicted here is Johanna the I of Naples. And uh, you know, she had a similar reputation where she's very promiscuous and um, stories of her, uh, again, roaming the streets of Naples, trying to identify future sex partners based off of the size of their nose. And then there's somewhat of a radio silence in this, 
this connection between the nose and the genitalia until uh, the contemporary period. Um, pictured here is uh, Dr. John McKenzie, who was a prominent uh, otolaryngologist at Johns Hopkins. And he had, was giving an address to the British Medical Association in the late 1890s in Montreal. And his, in his talk, we see a lot of these, uh, he bases the talk on a lot of his personal observation. He argues that these, are, these come out of observations he's made in his patients. But he discusses all of the same themes that we really just um, kind of reviewed from ancient um, and the Middle Evil, medieval period, you know, excessive venery leading to uh, recalcitrant catarrhal illnesses, um, the discussion of epistaxis and the, and the role it, it, um, or the frequency of epistaxis in certain dysmenorrhea's. So, um, you know, again, he based this all off of his personal observation and kind of gave it a nice uh, sheen, but um, you know, all the same themes that we had seen in the ancient and medieval period come up again in this contemporary period. The only difference now is that there's a um, um, new innovations or new discoveries happening where certain medications are being discovered and their effect on the human body. And this was actually a publication that um, was in the Journal of the American Medical Association. It was done by Dr. Emil Meyer, who was a uh, um, a laryngologist at the Mount Sinai Hospital. And he discussed, um, again, this is, you know, topical lidocaine, uh, topical anesthetics were just coming to kind of uh, regular use. And he was um, discussing how he had success in treating certain patients, um, certain female patients of his that were presenting with dysmenorrhea or sexual dysfunction. And the successes that he was having by anesthetizing those erectile patches that he saw in the inferior, inferior turbinates. And this really comes to a, um, a culmination with the case of Emma Eckstein. She was a Austrian author who sought treatment from uh, Dr. Sigmund Freud for uh, very significant dysmenorrhea and sexual dysfunction. And just to go, to, you know, to show you um, how widespread this theory had become and all of the very prominent names that it ended up enveloping, uh, Dr. Sigmund Freud also kind of uh, caught wind of this theory and proposed that she see one of his um, otolaryngologist friends, Dr. Wilhelm Fleiss, because um, he argued that this may be actually secondary to pathology of the nose that's manifesting itself as pathology in the genitalia. And uh, so Dr. Fleiss had, uh, was consulted on the case and he recommended that the patient undergo an inferior turbinectomy, which just means that they uh, take off the inferior turbinate, that little structure that I showed you in the beginning of the talk. Um, and everything had gone well with the procedure. He took off um, a portion of her inferior turbinate and he had, you know, he's not from Austria, so he had left the country. But uh, Emma Exine was uh, plagued in the immediate post-operative period by these bouts of uh, hemorrhage from her nose, foul smelling discharge, and eventually kind of uh, a gross infection. Because Dr. Fleiss had left the country already, uh, Dr. Freud had to enlist the help of a local ENT who discovered that Dr. Fleiss had left um, over half a meter of gauze packing in her nose, which led to uh, toxic shock syndrome and a pretty significant infection. It ultimately uh, left uh, half of her face caved in and some significant morbidity to the patient, um, which ultimately really tarnished the, the image of the theory but we still saw um, publications uh, purporting this bi-directional pathway up until the mid 20th century. And it had me and you know, my co-authors thinking, what, what is the lesson that really can be made here? And I think the first one is uh, this kind of uh, era that we were, were hopefully you know, think as we're kind of moved past, but eminence-based medicine in which your reputation within the field, how long you've been practicing, and your personal observations uh, trump any other uh, hierarchy of, of, uh, of proof. And yeah, just as a picture here, just some of the most kind of prominent uh, physicians known in American medicine, we have you know, Dr. Kelly with obstetrics gynecology, Dr. Osler with uh, internal medicine, Dr. Halstead in surgery, and uh, Dr. Welsh in pathology. Um, but you know, again, just given the uh, the names of those that were involved and the prominent positions, the prominent publications that they had, uh, you know, were, 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 had their findings published in. And I just think that a lot of this was really based off of a uh, personal observations and leaning 
on the reputation of those who are purporting them. So, I mean, how can we change that? You know, the current state of affairs in otolaryngology is much better than it was before. Um, this was actually an interesting piece that was published in the White Journal. Um, and it kind of reviews the number of uh, randomized controlled trials that were published in Odo, the major ENT journals recently. And while there's been a significant movement away from you know, these retrospective chart reviews or um, you know, case series towards randomized controlled trials, ENT as a field still significantly lag behind the leading internal medicine journals. So a lot of these um, interventions that we are kind of doing now, where there's still a, very, a paucity of, of data behind, we may one day in 50 years look back and be thinking, how can we have so you know foolishly been doing this? Um, and so it's a really, it's a call for um, a more humble approach to the, to the art that we practice. Um, just kind of brief conclusions from uh, summing up uh, basically things that we had, we had spoken about. These are my references for the talk. Thank you everybody. And I will stop share and open it up for any questions. Chat's quiet, but I have one question. Freud at that time knew about cocaine and used to study it in the nose. Any reasons why he didn't just try to coconize the inferior turbinate instead of sending it to fleece? That's, uh, that's an interesting question. I didn't come across any uh, like personal accounts from Dr. Freud of like his rationale there, but uh, I know I, yeah, I did read about him also kind of using cocaine and being really excited about the prospects cocaine had for some of his patients. <laughs> Very interesting and very informative talk. Our next presentation is by Dr. Jeffrey Fisher, who's clinical professor of medicine at Weill Cornell. And the title of his presentation is Osler's Deadliest Diagnosis. Dr. Fisher, take it away. Um, can we have my slides, please? Hello? Thank you. What I'd like to do today is discuss Osler's deadliest diagnosis. Um, this is a, a way of addressing uh, criticism that William Osler lacked social concern. And the take home message from this talk will be, um, what was this deadly diagnosis? How did Osler make it? Uh, what was his uh, solution for this problem? Next slide, please. So we know that Osler was a polymath and um, famous for bringing medical students to the patient's bedside, uh, which by the way, uh, met quite a bit of resistance in those days. Uh, patients did not want medical students touching them. He risked his career doing so. And he helped inculcate science into the practice of medicine. Therefore, many, uh, feel that Osler was the father of modern medicine. Next slide, please. This slide looks familiar. Uh, Osler's second from right, wearing his McGill scarf. Next slide. But in the century since uh, Sir William's death, um, a large number of criticisms have been aimed at him. Uh, Dr. Barrandes discussed whether the Oslerian medicine was dead, bedside medicine. Next slide, please. In addition, Dr. Charles Bryan in his encyclopedia, Sir William Osler, next slide, has several pages of criticisms of Sir William Osler. Next slide. Next slide. And next slide. Uh, 
one specific criticism of Osler was brought on by Donald Madison in his review of another one of Charles Bryan's books. And um, he specifically said that he thought that Osler was a social Darwinist who lacked social concern. And what I'd like to show you today is how Osler's deadliest diagnosis, in fact, showed he had great social concern. Next slide, please. And we can follow it with the next one. So the question is, did William Osler lack social concern? And what I'd like to do is um, go over his 1884 letter from Berlin in which uh, Osler uh, made his deadliest diagnosis. Next slide, please. This is Cushing's book, The Life of Sir William Osler. Uh, Cushing wrote this, he was an acolyte of Osler's and he wrote the book in 1925. It won the Pulitzer Prize in 1926. Next slide. Um, Osler spent six months in Europe for postgraduate training, um, much of it in Germany. Next slide, studying under Verkau. And what I'd like to turn your attention to is the bottom of the page. And what I'll do periodically is interrupt his letter with some uh, editorialization. So first Cushing wrote, writes, the letter closed with this charitable comment on the Semitic invasion of Berlin. So right away, what, what is this Semitic invasion of Berlin? What were they talking about? And Osa begins this part of the letter by saying, the modern quote, hep, 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 end of quote, shrieked in Berlin for some years past has no means died out. Does anyone here know what he was talking about? What is this hep, hep, hep? Well, we'll see in a few minutes. Osler continues, and to judge from the tone of several, next slide, please, of the papers, and you see on the top, of, it says the Jewish question, of the papers devoted to the Jewish question. What was the Jewish question? The Jewish question was, should Jews have citizenship? Were they citizens or were they the other? And he continues, there are not wanting some who would gladly revert to the plan adopted on the Nile some thousands of years ago for solving the Malthusian problem of Semitic increase. Doubtless there were then now, uh, there were then as now, noisy agitators, prototypes of the Parson Stalker. Who is Parson Stalker? Well, we'll see who he is in a few minutes. Who clamored for the hard laws which ultimately prevailed and for the taskmasters whose example so many Gentile generations have willingly followed of demanding where they safely could bricks without straw of their Israelite brethren. Should another Moses arise and preach a Semitic exodus from Germany, and should he prevail, they would leave the land impoverished. Far more was ancient Egypt by the loss of the jewels of gold and jewels of, sil and jewels of silver, of which the people was spoiled. To say nothing of the material wealth, enough to buy Palestine over and over again from the Turk. There is not a, a profession which would not suffer the serious loss of many of its most brilliant ornaments and in none more so than in our own. I hope to be able to get the data with reference to the exact number of professors and docents of Hebrew extraction in the German medical faculties. The number is very great and of those I know their positions have been won by hard and honorable work. But I fear that, as I hear has already been the case, the present agitation will help to make the attainment of university professorships additionally difficult. So that's sort of the Nuremberg Laws, which occurred in 1933. One cannot but notice here in any assembly of doctors the strong Semitic element at the local societies and in the German Congress of Physicians. It was particularly noticeable and the same holds good in any collection of students. All honor to them. Next slide. 
So here is Osler in 1884 in Berlin studying with Verkau. And this is the history of Jews in Germany. Let's, let's look starting in about 1878. So Adolf Stoecker, not Stoker, but Stoecker, was the Kaiser's personal chaplain. He founded the Christian Social Party, which spewed virulent anti-Semitism, particularly to the poor working Germans. In 79, Heinrich von Trich wrote treatises appealing to the elite regarding anti-Semitism. And in 1879, William Moore made it official by coining the term anti-Semitism to distinguish his philosophy of Jew hatred from anti-Judaism, and the Berlin anti-Semitism debate began. In 1881, Sar Alexander II was assassinated and started the pogroms in the Pale of Settlement. Thousands of Jews fled, including 50,000 Jews going to Berlin. The Eastern Jews, the Ausjudens, came to Berlin. Parenthetically, I'll show, you'll notice that 1881, George Ritter found Schnurrer, Schnurrer, maybe Schnurrer is better, was an Austrian nationalist who called himself the Fuhrer and asked people to seal, seek Heil to the Fuhrer. So if you thought Adolf Hitler invented that, you're wrong. In 1882, Stoecker convened the International Anti-Jewish Congress to expel, quote, the Semitic race of Jews from Europe. And this is the atmosphere that Osler found himself in. But how did he get this idea of buying Palestine? Next slide. This is a caricature of Stoecker, the parson, writing a characterized Jew. Next slide. How did Osler, where did the hep, hep, hep come from? Well, Osler was a great fan of George Eliot. He quoted Middlemarch quite a bit. Next slide. And in addition to being a respected novelist, translator, poet, and political commentator, George Eliot in a later life became a Hebrew scholar and early Zionist. What was her influence? She was influenced by Emanuel Deutsch, who in 1869 went to Israel and came back and was her tutor in Hebrew and spoke about Palestine becoming a national homeland for Jews. Next slide. Gert, the late Gertrude Himmelfarm wrote The Jewish Odyssey of George Eliot. Next slide, please which uh, occurred in two parts. Um, in 1876, she published Daniel Deronda, in which the protagonist discovers he's Jewish, and by the end of the novel, decides to go make homeland in Palestine. Uh, it's interesting that in the novel, as he's walking through the Jewish section, he has a, a reverie and he hears the crowd, the sound of crusaders in 1095 crying, hep, hep, hep. Next slide. George Eliot followed up with a political tract emulating Theophrastus. Next, Next slide. Theophrastus was uh, Aristotle's acolyte and wrote, a book characterizing Greek citizens. Next slide. And you can see the dissembler, the flatterer, the vulgar man, etc. And this is what George Eliot did. Next slide. In the modern hep hep hep. So in the modern hep hep hep, she talked about anti-Semitism and not so much physical damage uh, to Jews in England, but more the fact that they were the other and they should have a homeland where they could be united and not feel prejudiced. Next slide. Now, the word hep, hep 
has its origin in the Crusader call, Hierosolina et Perdidi. Jerusalem is lost to the Saracens, which caused the Crusaders to head east to regain Jerusalem. It also was the name of the Sirius riots in 1819, which began in Würzburg when Professor Brendel wrote a treatise supporting civil rights for Jews. The Jewish question, how many rights should Jews have in Germany? Next slide. This is a woodcut showing the, depicting the Hep Hep riots in 1819, which spreads throughout Germany into Poland and into Denmark. There was murder, looting of homes and businesses. This was, this presaged Kristallnacht. Next slide, please. So Hep 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 is found in Daniel Deronda and found in the modern Hep 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 written by Eliot. And Osler wrote it and incorporated it into his letter in 1884. Next slide. If you look at Eliot's work, the 1876 novel and the 1878 political treatise, they came 20 years before the first Zionist Congress in Basel. So Eliot, following her tutor, Deutsch, were early Zionists, and many streets in Israel are named after George Eliot. Next slide. You know, Mark Twain uh, was considered to be a philo-Semite, but what did he think about a Jewish homeland? He wrote, if that concentration of the cunningest brains in the world were going to be made in a free country, bar Scotland, I think it would be politic to stop it. It will not be well to let the race find out its strength. If the horses knew theirs, we should not ride anymore. Next slide, please. Why was Osler a philo-Semite? Why did he like Jews, the opposite of an anti-Semite? Well, he was raised as an evangelical Anglican, spent a lot of time reading the Old Testament. His initial career was to follow his father and become a clergyman, but decided, becoming a naturalist, uh, he decided to be uh, into medicine. I don't think one could fairly call Osler a social Darwinist, but he was a hardcore, he believed in a meritocracy. Remember his famous sentence was the master word is work. And he appreciated all the work of Jewish physicians um, and, and despite the prejudice they faced in attaining their positions. Next slide, please. So in summary, in contrast to his colleagues, particularly uh, Cushing, William Osler was a vocal philo-Semite. His 1884 letter from Berlin is evidence of his social concern for the fate of German Jews. And following the political writing of George Eliot and, and her novel, Daniel Deronda, Osler hoped that a modern day Moses would lead the German Jews, Jews to safety in Palestine. Hence, Osler was an early Zionist. In 1884 letter from Berlin, William Osler anticipated the Holocaust. This was his deadliest diagnosis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, but I just have two comments. Uh, Hep 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 was still with us in uh, Charlottesville and Osler had much to do with Hopkins. However, they had a strict quota until the 1970s and 1980s. Let us proceed to our next um, essayist is Dr. Jeffrey Levine, Associate Clinical Professor in Geriatric Medicine and Palliative Care, the Eichen School of Medicine at Mount Sinai Hospital and Medical School. And his contribution tonight will be the Jewish presence in the Fabrica of Asalias. Jeffrey, take it away. Okay, so am I on? Yes, sir. Great. So anyway, thank you everybody for signing in today. <clears throat> 
And our title today is Jewish Presence in the Fabrica of Vesalius. But first, before I start, I just want to give some stats that um, this year I had the honor of becoming a 30-year fellow of the Academy. And also, this is my fifth History Night presentation. And with that, I'm going to share my screen. All right, can somebody tell me whether my screen's being shared? Whoops. Is my screen yes, being shared? There. It is, good, okay, great. So um, this is my first slide and this is my, whoops, this is my second slide. And I just wanna point out that uh, this photo was taken in my happy place which is the rare book room of the New York Academy of Medicine, where, which has both the first and the second editions of the Fabrica, the Fabrica of Vesalius. And they're open on the table for me and my colleague and inspiration, Dr. Michael Nevins, uh, who's a cardiologist and historian who uh, gave me the inspiration for this project. And I just also want to give a plug for Dr. Nevins, who's doing a, um, a series at the Eldridge Street Synagogue on Jewish physicians. And he's in the middle of the series right now. I think there's two more left. So please Google that and sign on to Dr. Nevin's talk. So the other people I'd like to thank are Arlene Shainer, who's the reference libra librarian at the New York Academy of Medicine's Rare Book Room, who's helped me with many history projects over the years. And I also want to acknowledge Professor Stephanie Sigmund from the Jewish Theologic Seminary, who just completed a wonderful lecture series on Jews in Italy during the Renaissance, which was a key source for parts of my presentation. So today we are going to cover the following. Um, we're gonna first introduce the Fabrica. We're gonna talk about Jewish life in Renaissance Italy. We're gonna talk about the Jewish badge. We're gonna mention Vesalius's Jewish friend, Lazarus de Frigis. We're gonna talk about Hebrew nomenclature in the Fabrica. And we're going to talk about Jewish presence in the frontispiece of the Fabrica. And finally, the last point we're going to go over is Jewish presence in the historiated initial I. So I'm going to introduce the Dehumani Corporis Fabrica. Many of you know about it. For people who don't know about it, um, this book was published in 1543. And it is the most famous book of human anatomy ever printed. It's the starting point of modern anatomy and medicine, and it contains beautiful naturalistic portrayals of dissections of the human body. And the artist that did this may have come from the workshop of Titian, and al although uh, they're not named, we, we have some clues. There's one gentleman who's named Calcar, um, but we really don't know who they are. Uh, Vesalius took advantage of state-of-the-art printing technology to make this book. Um, it was printed in Basel, and uh, it was the movable type printing press was recently invented in 1436 by Gutenberg. So the movable printing, the movable uh, print technologies were a little bit more than 100 years old at the time this book was published. And this is a picture of the book. Uh, this is the Fabrica of Vesalius that's opened up to the bone men, and uh, I'm sure some of you have seen this. Um, it's classical, uh, classical presentation of bones. And one of the hallmarks of the Fabrica is the way he presented these dissected specimens as living beings. As you can see, the gentleman on the left is contemplating a skull and the gentleman on the right is just giving us a pose. Maybe he's complaining of back pain, but I'm not sure. Um, but we're gonna start our talk by giving you a, uh, introduction to Jewish life in Renaissance Italy. Jewish life and culture flourished in Renaissance Italy, which references the 15th and 16th centuries. This talk will deal primarily with events in Northern Italy, where Jews migrated from Southern Italy. They migrated from the North with German speaking Jews coming in, also called Ashkenazim, and later with the Sephardim, who were Jews, Jews that were expelled from Spain in 1492 and came to Northern Italy to settle. This culture is reflected in many writings, handwritten and illustrated manuscripts and printed matter. Much of this you can see in the rare book room of the Jewish Theological Cemetery, Uptown Manhattan, where I went. This, uh, this is from the Lombard Haggadah, which I don't think is in JTS, but they've got some other amazing uh, prints and manuscripts 
incunabula is what they're called for the early printed stuff uh, up at J JTS. But unfortunately, the Jews lived under sometimes very harsh and repressive conditions. And these are some of the things that they were subjected to. Uh, they were, there were restrictions on livelihood. There were restrictions on places to live in the mid uh, 16th century. There were the establishment of ghettos in the major cities. There were bans from holding public office. There were mandatory sermons that were encouraging conversion. And they say that many Jews showed up with cotton stuffed in their ears. There were Talmud burnings and many holy books are censored, have been censored. They actually drew uh, like magic markers through passages that they didn't like. Um, Jews were considered to be outsiders. And for Jews to live in any, any town, they had to sign a kandota, which is a residency per permit that was negotiated and paid for that guaranteed their security, allowed them to observe Jewish customs, for example, uh, that they won't be called to court on the Jewish holidays. And also it permitted them to have a, a Jewish cemetery. There were, were restrictions on clothing. They were, uh, for example, prohibited from ostentatious garments. They had mandatory clothing and mandatory badges that they were supposed to wear to identify themselves, which we're gonna talk about very shortly. And there was a great deal of invective and hatred that were preached by the clergy, specifically the Franciscan friars. And one of the things that were that came about was the belief that Jews murdered Christian children for ritual purposes. And this is uh, called the blood libel accusation. We're gonna talk about this in a moment. Okay, so um, when we think of the Jewish badge, we think of these images from Nazi Germany where Jews were forced to wear a yellow Star of David. But this was not an original idea. For centuries, since the 13th century, Jews in Europe were often forced to wear a distinguishing badge. Here you see a print from, uh, I guess this is 16th century Germany, where a Jewish man is wearing a Jewish O. He's also carrying uh, some stalks of garlic and also a uh, a money bag, all, both of which were associated with Jewish stereotypes. So let's introduce the Jewish badge in Northern Italy. It began in 1215 at the Fourth Lateran Council, where Pope Innocent III ordered the Jews to be distinguished from Christians by the nature of their clothing. It was variably enforced throughout Northern Italy depending upon local politics, uh, the specific location of the town, and also negotiations between Jews and the uh, and the secular government that that enforced these things. There were several Jewish badges uh, throughout Europe, but the yellow O became the symbol of the Jews in northern Italy, and the O, according to Christian theology, stood for nothingness and evil, indicating the low status of the Jew and their non-entity among men. Did you know that in the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, there's an example of the Jewish O? This is Michelangelo's painting of Aminadab, who was prince of the Levites and father-in-law of Aaron. And you can see on his shoulder, he's wearing the Jewish O, signifying that he's a Jew. And this is a photo I recently took in a church in Northern Italy. This might shock some people. I took this in, the, in a church in the town of Pian Comuno. It's a fresco painted in late 15th century that depicts Jews, a group of Jews draining blood from a Christian child in preparation for the holidays. This is a picture of the infamous blood libel. And we can do a little close up. And this fresco is faded, but you can plainly see that most of the Jews are wearing the Jewish badge, the Jewish O, to identify them. So let's turn to our next topic. I'd like you all to open up your Fabricas to page 166. If you don't have a Fabrica, just look at this slide and go to line six. 
This is the page that introduces the narrative index for the identification and naming of bones. Vesalius is going to give us the names of every bone in Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, and even give us and accom even accommodate us with a guide to Hebrew pronunciation with transliteration of the, of the pronunciation. So on this page, Vesalius gives credit to his Hebrew teacher, and this is in Latin, but I'm gonna translate it for you. He says, with the aid of a prominent physician and close friend of mine, Lazarus Hebraeus de Frigis, and in parentheses he, he notes, with whom, I accustom, who, with whom I am accustomed to work with on Avicenna, who was a, uh, a Jewish doctor from the East who spoke Arabic. So if you, want to name, if you want to know the name of a bone in Hebrew, you first go to the skeleton and find the Greek letter of the bone you want. So here we have our skeleton who we saw earlier, and he's leaning against the table, contemplating a skull. And we're going to look at the beta, which is on what we know as the frontal bone. And then we go to the index, and we find the Greek letter, and we read the names of the bones. And you'll see in Hebrew, this bone is the etzem hamesach, etzem hamesach. Hope I didn't slaughter that, but uh, this is the frontal bone in Hebrew. And here's another cool one I like. It's atzmos havanim, or bones like stones, which refers to the temporal bone also of the skull. So you can find Hebrew for any bone in these, in these uh, two gentlemen who you see pictured in the Fabrica of Vesalius. So we're going to move on to the frontispiece of the Fabrica that is pictured here. We see a raucous dissection scene with the master Vesalius at the center dissecting a female who has just been executed. There are over 50 people in the galley that include students, clerics, soldiers, scholars, and lay people who came by to watch. Let's look closer at this group. You can see an articulated skeleton in the center, and we'll, and we'll pay close attention to the spectator who stands in the top row on our right. Here he is. This man has been identified as the Jewish doctor Lazarus de Frigis, who, who assisted Vesalius with his Hebrew. How do we know he's a Jewish doctor? Take a look at his clothes and specifically his hat. And compare his clothes and his hat to this print that comes from the East in Constantinople. It features Moses Haman, a contemporary who was friend and advisor to Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent, ruler of the Ottoman Empire. Jewish doctor to, Mag to Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent. Compare his hat. So I've been looking at the frontispiece for a long time and I was always puzzled by this, by this picture here. And I wanna show you why I'm puzzled and to demonstrate, I'm gonna add color in Photoshop. I didn't mark up the original because that would have upset Arlene Shainer. So for this slide, I added flesh tone to his face and hands and darkened his clothes. And you see the body language? His head is turned away from the dissection and he's got an upset facial expression. He might be looking at the man to his left and his left hand is up in a surprised defensive position. Why is he expressing this body language? Is he cringing at the sight of the, the dissection below? It's highly unlikely as he's a seasoned medical doctor. The answer is the man next to him. And I'm going to add color to emphasize what I am seeing. Here is a spectator with his first turned with his face turned toward the Jewish doctor. He's saying something with an angry expression on his face. And the clue to this scene is here. He's pulling his cloak away so he doesn't have to touch the Jewish man as he's jostled by the crowd. What we are witnessing is an altercation, perhaps with angry words between a man in the crowd and the man who was clearly identified by his, Jewish clo by his clothing as a Jewish doctor from the East. Only in the context of the relationship of Jews to the outside secular world can this tableau be understood. So here's our uncolored frontispiece. So hard to see the interaction, but now that I showed you, it's definitely here. And after, after over 400 years of Vesalian scholarship, this interaction has never been identified. And I'm just gonna show it to you once again. Here's the without color, 
And here's with color, with this gentleman pulling his coat back to avoid touching the Jewish man. And now we're going to turn to secrets that are embedded within the historiated initials. What is a historiated initial? A historiated initial is an enlarged letter at the beginning of a paragraph or section of text that contains a picture. The, histori the historiated initials in the Fabrica contain scenes that are directly related to the study and practice of medicine and the preparation of bodies for dissection. The historiated initials of the Fabrica use images of puti, the singular, sing singular is puto, or naked male children, to enact the scenes. So this is an example of a historiated initial L. Okay, and as you can see, um, the what we're what we're looking at is a group of puti who are taking a executed criminal down from the gallows to take off to the uh, dissecting table. And as you can see, the uh, puti to the left, to our left, is holding the crowd back, saying, "Step back! We're taking this body to the master Vesalius so he can dissect it." So this is the historiated eye, which appears on the page of the fabrica that introduces the ligaments and muscles. The artist is showing us the scene of a body snatching at night. Let's colorize this image so we can see more clearly the meaning of the tableau. So here we see a group of puti bringing a corpse out of a tomb. The puto on the left holds back the lid with one hand and holds a candle in the other while his colleagues lift up the corpse out of the grave. And let's look at the guards. Here we see that, the, that their clandestine evening activity is being sanctioned and protected by the local government. We have to our right a puto with a shield, and in the center we have a soldier with a helmet and a spear, and to our left there are two official-looking spectators, one of whom is wearing some sort of official-looking hat. And accompanying the upper right corner of the scene, a naked puto flies in carrying a pennant. After learning more history about Jews and about Jews and Jewish law and history at the time, this scene is going to make more sense. You see, Jewish corpses were preferred by the anatomists of the day because, according to Jewish law, burial needs to be soon after death. This is in contrast to the non-Jewish custom of having a wake which delays the burial and allows the corpse to decompose before being placed into the ground. So knowing this and knowing about the sign of the Jew, which is up here on the pennant, this composition now makes perfect sense. The flying figure is confronting the guard who lifts his head up in surprise. He's perhaps a representative of the Jewish community or maybe even a relative of, of the deceased protesting the disinterment that is being depicted at the lower left. So let's look at all these, all these pieces put together. The artist has given us a hidden lesson in which some of Vesalius specimens have come, showing us where some of Vesalius' specimens have come from, that is freshly de disinterred and recently deceased Jews and the unhappy relationship, the unhappy reaction of the Jewish community. Let's go back to the uncolored version. Now this enigmatic scene of the flying puto with the pennant makes perfect sense. Again, in 480 years of Vesalian scholarship, this has not been revealed or discussed, but in retrospect, the Jewish O gives this scene away. So in summary, here's what we did today. We went over the Hebrew names of bones with the help of Lazarus de Frigis, who helped Vesalius with putting Hebrew into the, into the fabrica. We talked about the frontispiece with the incident in the audience between a Jewish physician and a spectator. And we talked about the exhumation of a Jewish body for dissection as illustrated in the historiated eye. And now we know that the illustrations for anatomic dissections in the, in the Fabrica of Vesalius, some of which are based upon stolen Jewish bodies. And that's going to end my talk. And we can take questions. Uh, there's one comment, Jeffrey, in the sure. chat, quotes, this is an incredible talk. I'm just adding the exclamation point. Really, thank you for a really fascinating and very useful contribution to the history of medicine. There's a lot more to it, as you know, in the Defabrica. And now, wow. we go how, do I, how do I unshare my screen? Uh, yes. has, my, has my screen been unshared? 
just, just close off and you're okay. Our last um, SAS is given by Dr. Andrew Spielman, who's professor of the Department of Molecular Pathology and director of the Rare Book Library and Historical Archives at the New York University College of Dentistry, and Ms. Arlene Shainer, who is the Historical Collection Reference Librarian here at the New York Academy of Medicine Library. And the title of the uh, talk is John Greedwood's Side Notes on a 1778 John Hunter text at the New York Academy of Medicine. I think that uh, Andrew is going to give the presentation. So Andrew, you're on, you're on camera. Thank you so much for this uh, opportunity. Um, <clears throat> so this is a collaboration with Arlene Shainer, who accidentally came upon this particular volume uh, at the library. Let's just look at the protagonist. So some of you or most of you heard about John Hunter. He is the famous uh, surgeon, the father of modern surgery, who in 1771 published the natural history of the human teeth. And then in 1778, he added a second volume to it, but it became a second edition. So we're talking about the 1778 volume that is in the New York Academy of Medicine Library. The other protagonist is John Greenwood, and the audience may not know about him, but he's known to be one of the many dentists that try to make dentures for George Washington. Apparently, at least eight dentures were made, uh, one more disgusting contraption than the other, but this particular one that you see here is at the New York Academy of Medicine, and it was one of the better dentures that George Washington wore. Now, the cross-section of these two protagonists is a book, this particular 1778 edition, that Arlene Shainer accidentally discovered some amazing side notes on 21 pages, extensive side notes. So the question is, are these important? And the short answer is yes, they are. So this is a brief outline. We're gonna look briefly at John Greenwood's family, at Hunter's and importance of his book. Then we have to ask the question and look for evidence. Is this John Greenwood's copy? Second, are the annotations in his handwriting? And what do they say and are they scientifically important? So. This is, in a nutshell, John Greenwood's family. He comes from Norwich, England. His uh, early ancestors, Nathaniel Greenwood, came to the American colonies in 1654, and he was a shipbuilder. Uh, his ancestors were serving Henry VII, Cromwell. So we see that one of his grandchildren is Isaac Greenwood, who became a uh, mathematics professor at Harvard, and his son was John Greenwood, George Washington, then uh, uh, Washington's dentist father. Isaac Greenwood is a, an ivory turner. He was selling mathematical devices, but he became a self-taught dentist. And John Greenwood, his son, became a dentist. By the way, anyone in yellow, this is just uh, sort of an underestimation. They were all dentists in uh, John Greenwood's family. He was born in 1760. We know that he had formal education only up till his fourth elementary school. Then he became at 15. He uh, joins Washington as a fifer. He serves eight more years on a ship. And then in 1784, he turns back, he returns to New York, where he starts practicing dentistry. And it has to be a self-taught process. He is, um, has thought that he had extraordinary mechanical skills. Um, he starts his practice, and uh, he, among the, the 34 years of practice, he counts George Washington among his patients. John Hunter, uh, his Natural History of the Human Teeth, his, this is the first edition, became a, a bestseller instantly. And over the next 100 years, this book had seen 10 editions. Um, 
He worked with his brother, William, who is a dissector uh, assistant, an anatomist and surgeon. He becomes uh, apprentice to Percival Pott and in, uh, he becomes full surgeon. Then he is elected to the Royal Society and finally becomes surgeon extraordinaire to King George III. So this particular book that we see, The Natural History of the Human Teeth, is a, a remarkable volume that, uh, at least in English language, is one of the first to comprehensively look at dentistry. Now, how is, uh, is how do we know that this is John Greenwood's copy? So in an interview in 1864, Isaac Greenwood II, this is John Greenwood, the Washington's dentist grandson, talks about his grandfather. It says, Isaac John Greenwood is unable to say how his grandfather obtained his information in dentistry, but that in a portrait of him, a life-size portrait, his left hand is leaning over a book, a copy of this particular book. Now, if we look carefully, this is a magnified view, and you can see that you probably can discern that this is really the first part of that book. The question is, is this his copy? And the answer is yes, because on the front page, John Greenwood signs John Greenwood, New York, Surgeon Dentist, 1787. So this is three years after he starts his practice. And the book that was originally his father's <coughs> has been transferred to him because the father and, and one of the other sons already, they practice in Boston. So clearly now he owns this book. Furthermore, in 1792, he advertises himself as possessing a perfect knowledge of Mr. Hunter's practice. And among other things, he says, with the general approbation of the first families of the US, as well as foreigners. So he's very proud of his book and he's very proud of having been uh, George Washington's dentist. Question four that we're asking are the annotations in his handwriting. And although I'm not a handwriting expert, comparing a 1779 journal of John Greenwood, this is a midshipman's journal, and this is the side notes from 1804. Now, I'm going to point you to the C, the letter C that he uses in the diary and the ones that we see in his side notes. And our, my argument is that they are pretty close. When you look at the word after, it's the very same uh, feature. The letter F, you can see that they match. And finally, the I, the letter I is in the same format. Uh, the fact that they use the same ink, perhaps this was the only available, I'm not gonna make much of it, but it is clear that these two handwritings are uh, very similar, even though they are 25 years or 20, uh, yes, 25 years apart. Who made notations in this book? By and large, the 21 pages that we have uh, scoured and looked at, the vast majority are John Greenwood's based on handwriting and based on the theme. And they date from the 1787, 99, 1804 is the vast majority, a few from 1808 and 1809. Charles, or actually it's Clark Greenwood, his son, makes an, some annotations, and then two lesser important annotations are visible. The question is, what do they say? And there are three categories that I want to cover. You can see on the left side, this is the extent that he would make side notes over many pages. So the first that I want to talk about is the cause of tooth destruction and gum disease. Up to this point, you may not know, but in 18, up to 1800s, the tooth worm was the prevailing uh, theory of causing decay. Well, this is what um, John Greenwood is writing. 
it says the reason for tooth destruction is owing to a strong acid. This is actually a remarkable observation because even um, John Hunter thinks that the cause of tooth destruction comes from inside rather than from the outside. So for John Greenwood to make this statement is quite remarkable. The fact that he understands that acid can dissolve enamel is uh, also a, 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 an amazing insight. Now, he has no way of knowing uh, bacterial product produced uh, and uh, acid, but he identifies stomach as the only source for that. Now, looking at what can cause uh, periodontal disease, he says the other cause of destruction of the teeth is an accumulation of the earth called tartar. So calculus or tartar was already known, but he now identifies as the cause that creates the uh, gum disease. It says it's nothing more than the sediment of the breast which sticks to the teeth and forms a hard substance. Exactly like that which adheres to the bottom of the tea cattle, it will insinuate itself between the gums and the teeth and separate them by degrees so as to lose the teeth and in time causes them to drop out. It is not removed in, if it's not removed in time. Next, he talks about the mechanism. He actually has a theory and he says that all that calculus cutting and the small fibers and blood vessels in such a manner as to set the gums in a state of inflammation. A remarkable idea, describing that periodontal disease or gum disease as he calls it, is really caused by inflammation by cutting the small fibers that we now know is the periodontal ligaments and blood vessels. That means that tooth need blood supply, nourishment, and the teeth in time become loose by loosing, losing their nourishment and support and finally drop out sound and whole. By the way, he had four elementary schools and therefore his spelling is atrocious. Nevertheless, of course, there was no standard of English at the time. Nevertheless, and what you see in these quotes, I'm trying to actually use the exact quote that he has used in the book. Finally, he talks about Anamalkula. Now, anyone who studied Leeuwenhoek and his microscope, Leeuwenhoek is the first that describes these small animals. Now, here we see John Greenwood using the same term, although different spelling, in which he says, if teeth and gums are permitted to be in a foul, dirty condition, they are subject to create thousands of creatures called anamalcula. They will be found if you will take the trouble to examine by the assistance of a microscope. John Greenwood, a self-taught individual, has a microscope. It says, multitudes of these creatures of four different kinds between all your teeth and buried in between the gums and teeth, the way for you to see them is to take a pin or needle, put it between your teeth and bring out the whitish or other matter that is to share and apply to the microscope, if you will, quick see them tumbling over one another like maggots on rotten meat. These creatures cannot live nor create except in filth and rottenness. This is astounding for someone in 1804 to make this connection. It took another 37 years before German scientists came up with this connection. The last piece that he's talking about is prevention. And of course, prevention is not new, but he says, brush your gums frequently and your teeth also with weak alkali, which is common chalk and Spanish whiten. It will certainly preserve these. So question is, are these scientifically important? Well, he's talking about the cause of destruction as strong acid. He's the first to make that statement. The cause of gum disease is the accumulation of calcar, of tartar. This is not new, but he essentially makes the connection to the destruction of the teeth and the presence of anamalcula. And he also talks about these sediments destroying the blood supply, causing inflammation. So it is a remarkable insight before 
1840, when Erdl, a German scientist, makes this uh, as of as of, as what we know right now. Historically, Leeuwenhoek is the first to talk about animalcula. Greenwood is the second. Bullman, in 1840, talks about pathogens having fiber-like structures. In 1840. Erdl in 1841 talks about parasites. Robert Ficinius identifies under the microscope a pathogen and calls it denticoli, but it takes another 50 years before the Michigan-born Willoughby Miller in 1890, working with Robert Koch in Berlin, comes up with the chemoparasitic path, uh, theory. So in conclusion, Greenwood is a self-taught dentist who had remarkable insight and identified the cause and the mechanism of caries and periodontal disease 37 years earlier than, what, than we currently know. And it's no mistake that George Washington picked him as his dentist. In 1799, he said, I shall always prefer your services to that on any other in the line of your present profession. I just want to acknowledge two of my students who did the background uh, research, Abby Lepore and Josh Koshkin, and I thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Arlene and Andrew. Uh, it is really amazing what, they, what he did and his knowledge of the microscope. I would like to thank all the essayists uh, that gave our papers tonight. Really, uh, one of the purposes, if not the major purposes, is the creation of new knowledge and the dissemination of the same. And I really feel tonight we really did this quite well with these four presentations. So again, my many thanks from the executive committee, from the committee at home, from the academy, and to all of us who've been so privileged. I wish you all a wonderful summer, and we'll see you again next year. And with that, good evening.